Hey, what is going on everybody? My name is Payne. Hope you guys had an amazing Christmas and welcome back to another review video, the final video of 2018. I want to make this video very special because this isn't just a normal review video. As you can see already in this video, there's already a lot of changes. Uh, for example, I got a new tripod and setup. There's lights now. I don't have to rely on the window over here and I don't have to do white balance during editing. And that instead of reviewing one show in this video, I'm going to be re reviewing, what is it? Eleven. <laughs> I'm going to be reviewing eleven shows. I don't know why it took me that long. But really, this came up after I realized how stupid it was that I made six separate videos on the shows that I watched during the summer of 2018. I reviewed Cells at Work, I reviewed Angels of Death, uh, Asa Be Asa Basa. I still say that's, my fun that's the funniest show of the year. Uh, but the problem was is that I reviewed it in six separate videos, and I didn't want to do that anymore, considering the amount of shows I'm watching here. And this is also a good uh, starting point for me because I have a lot of shows planned to watch for winter of 2019, so expect this, that video to be longer than this one. Now, because this is my first time doing this, there's a couple of rules that I've set myself up for. Uh, the first one is that all the shows but one are done. There's one show that I've watched that is still going on and will end in the winter of 2019. Uh, I also didn't review any shows that were a part of a franchise, so I didn't watch uh, SAO Elicization, I didn't watch JoJo's Golden Wind, and to some people's dismay, I did not review A Certain Magical in next Season 3. There's a couple people that uh, don't know if I watched it or not, and I'm just going to tell straight up right here I didn't watch it. <laughs> but fortunately, that won't apply to the winter of 2019 anime season, because I will be watching Mob Psycho Season 2 and the Komodo Friends Season 2. Hey, don't judge, don't judge me. And that the final thing is how is the order I'm going to be reviewing these shows. I'm going to review them by days of the week, which means I'm going to be starting with shows that I watch on Sunday and ending with shows that I watch on Saturday. But also, uh, for anyone who's watching this who hasn't seen any of these shows before, keep in mind I'm going to probably spurt out some spoilers here and there. So, for anyone who hasn't seen these shows yet, you have been warned. Alright, let's start with Sunday, and let's talk about the first show that I watched, known as Anima Yell. It was directed by Masako Sato, and it was one of two anime series that was made by the anime studio Doga Kobo. They made one on Friday, we're gonna get to that there. So the show follows a girl named Kahone, who watches a group of cheerleaders during a sporting event, and then decides to form a cheerleading club. For, uh, of her own at her school. That's really it. Overall, I'm fairly neutral about this show, as with other shows that Doga Kobo has made, such as Juru Yuri and Hamoto Umaru-chan, the animation is what really stands out to me because no matter how cheaply made it looked, it makes the show as upbeat as it should be, considering that it's about cheerleading. The main cast are your average cookie cutter characters when it comes to shows like this. You have the energetic character who just wants to help people, in this case it's on the main character, you have the one who's skeptical about the whole thing, but eventually gets into it. And then you have the one character who tries to break up the group, but eventually does get into it as well. And at the end of the day, Anima Yell just looks like Love Live if it had a very cheap budget and it was about cheerleading. Overall, for me, it's not bad, but there's also nothing special to it. I'm going to give Anima Yell a 6 out of 10. Our next anime, speaking of Love Live, is the latest anime series from the studio Sunrise, directed by Joji Furuta. It is Double Decker, Doug, and Kirill. To summarize this show in one sentence, this is the greatest futuristic cop show I've ever seen. The show follows two cops, veteran Doug Billingham and rookie Kirill Vrubel, I hope I said that right, who works for the 7-0 Special Crimes Investigation Unit in a police department in the, in the city known as Lis Valletta. The series follows the two who were paired by the department's Double Decker system, hence the name of the show, and the rest of the unit as they work on cases related to a deadly drug known as Anthem and try to take down a group known as Esperanza who plans on using Anthem to take over the world. The premise is really the only thing out of the whole show that's not original. The characters in this show all have unique personalities that all coincide with each other, such as the rude character, the eccentric character, there's a robot, and even the normal character is in this is the exact opposite of what she's labeled as. But the relationship between the two main characters, Doug and Kirill, stood out to me because of the always changing development between the two throughout the series. When the series began, Kirill was nothing more than an unexperienced rookie who was being made fun of while Doug was the veteran who would always want to get the job done. But as they work together more and more on different cases throughout the series, they do start appreciate, 
appreciating each other's contribution to the situation at hand. And the plot starts off a little cliche when it comes to solving crimes after a while. It's almost like a cop show. That's why I said that it's, you know, the best futuristic cop show I've ever seen. But when it shifts towards our main antagonist, Esperanza, when these cases come together, you can feel that they're realizing, hey, this is a big deal. We need to handle this. Like, this is really affecting them. The animation stands out just as much as Sunrise put a lot of effort into the characters and the setting of the show as, again, it looks like it's set in the future and that all the characters are colorful. And finally, the music, in my opinion, is the best part of the show. Is the original soundtrack. It has a couple of jazz and R&B tracks, which I really like. And it has the catchiest ending out of all the shows. I can just imagine myself playing air guitar while listening to the ending. It's just, just so fun. And overall, for me, this show has a balanced mix of action and comedy and, in my opinion, is seriously underrated. And I hope this show gets a season two and I hope more people get to watch this. I'm gonna give Double Decker Doug and Kirill an eight out of 10. And the final anime that I watched on Sunday is Gaikatsu Shotenen Honda-san, also known as Skullface Bookseller Honda-san. It was directed by Uru, T Uru Todoroki as the latest anime from a studio known as DLE. Originally a webcomic, this story mainly follows a bookstore worker named Honda-san. Who is, who is in the form of a skeleton with clothing and his experiences in the bookstore he works in. And the main thing in this show that I'm really impressed about is the accuracy when it comes to physical manga releases in Japan and popular releases, making it not only batshit insane, but also batshit educational. And the witty remarks and the reactions that Honda makes either in his skull or out loud makes the comedy all the more priceless. And not only do I think that Honda's co-workers are pretty funny considering this is a slice of life show and it's very accurate when it comes to what they're representing. I kind of sympathize with them a little bit, which in the end for me makes this short series very memorable. I mean, it's 12 episodes, but each episode is 11 minutes long, so it's not that hard for you to catch up. To be completely honest, I'm not a manga guy, but I feel like I might turn into one after watching this. I'm going to give school Facebook seller Honda San a 9 out of 10. All right, so let's talk about the only show that came out on Monday, and it's also the only show that is still going on, and that is Tensei Shitada Suramu Dadaken, also known as That Time I Got Reincarnated as a Slime. It was directed by Yasuhiro Kikuchi, who is the director of Infinite Stratos, and is the latest anime from a studio known as 8-Bit. As of, of the making of this video, the show follows a guy named Satoru who is stabbed to death and is, as the title states, reincarnated as a slime named Rimuru Tempest. <laughs> I never said that before in person. That just sounds weird. Uh, anyway, he later meets many different travelers and monsters and acquires different skills in the process from eating things, which unfortunately it also includes the ability to turn into a human. Yeah, he ate a human. So yeah, this is basically sounding like just a normal slime isekai and uh, I suggest you watch Gigix's video on it. He made one about a few days ago and he basically went more into detail about it than I would, but you know, I'm just going to tell you what I have. So at this point, the characters that Rimuru meets are all pretty memorable, especially from the women, because even though he's a slime, he's also a perv. But overall, their encounters with Rimuru don't feel forced and makes me appreciate those characters for what they are outside of just being a side character, such as Gabta, which is one of a few goblins that Rimuru meets, and Shizu especially Shizu. I'm still not over that. <laughs> so far, the animation is very top-notch, and the fight scenes are very detailed, and the one thing I gotta say is about the opening and the ending, mainly that I thought it was funny how there were people complaining on social media how people that we saw in both the opening and the ending didn't show up in the show until about episode 8 or 9, and while some people saw it as annoying, I kind of saw it as pretty funny, and that uh, it was also an anticipation for what the show had to offer. So far, uh, I'm giving this show a 9 out of 10. I'm actually looking forward to see what this show has to, has to offer in the second half of the series. Alright, now here is the only show that I saw on Tuesday, and is the only show that actually makes me want to kill myself. And that is a show known as Jingai Saw no Yome, which is... Translation... You non-human creature wife. Holy shit, what was I doing with my life? This was co-directed 
by Hisayoshi Hirasawa and Takumi Shibata and is the latest anime from a studio known as Saeta. It is 12 episodes and they're 3 minutes long, and that is 36 minutes I am never getting back. <laughs> the show follows a guy named Tomari who is being told he is getting married to a mysterious creature called Kaneogi. But not only that, Tomari is the wife instead of being the husband. Soon after, he meets a couple of more guys who are in the same situation, and they spend the rest of the series just interacting with each other. Uh, all I wrote in the script is that this show is shit. Uh, there is nothing this show is good for. Uh, the logic is completely off. There's no one questioning, hey, why is this guy with this being? Uh, and uh, clearly, this is intended for fans of Yaoi. I just, I should have noticed. But at the same time, I'm the blame here, because I straight up watched this show and actually spent three minutes every Tuesday watching this show. I'm, I don't feel good about myself right now, but, you know, I'm, I'm happy I'm through with it. Uh, just because of the episode is, th again, the episodes are three minutes long, the animation's pretty cheap, and that's it. I, there is nothing else. And, I'm, I, fuck it, I'm not going to say any more about this show. I'm going to give it a two out of ten. It's got some good shit. Oh, some good fucking cider. All right, this one I got a lot of shit to talk about. This is the one show that I watched on Wednesday. It is known as Seishin Budiado wa Bunny Girl Senpai no Yume wo Minai, also known as Rascal Does Not Dream of a Bunny Girl Senpai. It is directed by Soichi Masui, and it is the latest anime from Cloverworks, which is a subsidiary of A1 Pictures. I said it uh, in my Darling in the Franks review as they helped out with that. Uh, the story is not about bunny girls or is anywhere close to a harem as the title states, but instead the story is about a guy named Sakuda who helps out a girl named Mai Sakurajima with what is known as puberty syndrome, which is basically a physical manifestation of what a certain person is going through. In this case, because she is in the spotlight a lot, because she is an actor, Mai had turned invisible. No one sees her. He eventually helps her out and... The series follows Sakura as he helps out a few other characters resolve their problems, including his little sister. The key word uh, for me with this show is universal, because it's a show that people of all ages can relate to because it portrays the struggle of adolescence, growing up to being mature, though through these supernatural incidents. Uh, the characters are universally likable once you find out what events in their past or what had inflicted on them and that, that, <laughs> that now made them the person that they are, making it almost impossible to not understand what they're going through. Each character that Sakura helps gets the right amount of development in their arc, but that's not the only time we see them as we see them in later arcs as well, just with smaller roles. And one example being Mai and her sister switching bodies with, the, with each other, proving to one another, one another how the other is being treated. And to me, that hits too close to home be, for me because my brother and I would always be compared by almost everyone we met. And in some cases, it's just still going on today. So another example is Sakata's little sister, Kaede, dressing up in something other than a panda onesie. And although she still speaks in third person, the fact that she made a change like that is huge for someone who's trying to mature. And it's revealed that that's the case because she lost her memories due to being bullied so much and had to relearn it all again, making her pain worse among the other characters until she gets her memories back. The characters overall are some of the most intriguing that I've seen this season. And it's just... I, I can't find any other words for it other than I'm giving this a 10 out of 10. Alright, from one popular show to another, we're going to talk about the only show that I watched on Thursday. And that was the latest anime from Munahisha Sakai and from studio MAPPA, known as Zombie Land Saga. The story follows a girl named Sakura who gets run over by a car and gets killed. She wakes up 10 years later as a zombie who is being held hostage by a guy named Kotaru, who tells her, along with a group of other zombies, that they have to make an idol group known as Franshu Shu, I hope I'm saying that right, to save the Saga Prefecture. Considering that the series was made by MAPPA, they always do a really good job of making the characters look real, and it's always a plus from me. One thing that really stood out to me about the story is that in the middle to about towards the end of the series, it does a really good job in terms of balancing which character gets what amount of character development each episode. By that, I mean that with the large amount of characters that are in the show, Mappa and Tsukai both do a really good job of making sure that one character doesn't have too much development or that we don't get flustered with too much information, such as an episode for Saki, the biker chick, or to one with the smallest member in the group, Lily. 
But it does get to the point in the final few episodes where uh, the focus is on the main character, Sakura, and it also leaves us with a few unanswered questions and assumptions, such as the possibility that Kotaru might have went to high school with Sakura when she was alive, to a guy who's attempting to put the pieces together when it comes to where the members came from. The characters are all lovable in their own right, and as you learn about their backstories or what they do as the series goes on, you understand more of what they're going through. I mean, just think about it. They're dead. They can't really do anything anymore other than dance for Kotaru, who, in my opinion, is the greatest asshole I've ever seen. As even though he yells at the girls a lot, he also shows how much he cares for them, especially to Sakura, who again, he probably knew in high school. Again, going back to what I said earlier, considering that it's MAPPA, uh, the animation is really well done, though the only complaint I have is regarding the CGI during the performances, but other than that, I was fine with it. But for, but for the soundtrack, uh, holy shit, the soundtrack is really freaking amazing. Probably the best of the year. Uh, the songs are catchy, jumpy, and no matter what they are, from a song that they performed on the stage to the freaking song that they sang during the chicken commercial, which was surprisingly catchy, uh, it'll get stuck in your head. Even though that song wasn't technically theirs, that, that was an actual chicken place. That was their song. I just think it's cool that they added it there. It's just a real thing. Although, in my opinion, this wasn't the best show of the year, this was the most entertaining. Let's just hope for a season two and or a Zombieland Saga movie, I'm gonna be giving this one a 10 out of 10. All right, so now we have the first of two shows that I watched on Friday. The first one is a show known as Miss Vampire that lives in my neighborhood. It was directed by Noriyuki Akita and is a co uh, co cooperative effort by Studio Axis and Studio Gokumi. The first time that they've worked together since earlier this year when they released the show Miss Koizumi Loves Ramen Noodles back in the winter of 2018. The story follows a middle school student named Akari who meets a vampire named Sophie Twilight that looks about her age in the woods after being told that there is a mysterious mansion near her neighborhood. She becomes fascinated with the fact that she's meeting a legit vampire and later lives with Sophie at the mansion, later revealing that Sophie is not just any normal vampire. She is a otaku who orders anime items online and drinks blood that's been refrigerated, not from actual people, among many other things. This is the most wholesome show of the fall 2018 season. Over time, the development between Akari and Sophie grew from just one character bugging the other to a genuine relationship. As Sophie understands that at the end of the day, no matter what happens, Akari just really just cares about her. And the side characters only add to the amount of wholesomeness that the show has, for better or for worse. It's also one of those shows where it has jokes that only worked in this show because it made fun of the fact that Sophie is 350 years old, yet she has the mind of a child she's an otaku, and that even though she's a vampire, she still gets scared by other shit. Oh my god. There's one episode where Sophie says that werewolves don't exist. A vampire said that werewolves don't exist. Where the hell would you, where the hell would you find that? It's jokes like these that makes the show all the more special. If you're looking for a pretty good slice of life show, this one should definitely be on your radar, but really all I can say is that, that that's really all the show is, a slice of life show. If you're not into slice of life shows, I don't suggest you watch this. If you're into slice of life shows, I highly suggest you watch this, but it does, yeah, it doesn't present itself anything other than that. I'm gonna give it a seven out of 10. I think, I think it's pretty good for what it is. And the final show that I watched on Friday was a show known as Uchu no Maid no Usagiru, also known as Our Maid is Way Too Annoying. It is the latest anime directed from Masahiko Oda and is the second anime series from Belga Kobo. Uh, the second from Anna Bayel. Uh, Oda, I've seen a couple of his stuff. He was the one who directed uh, Yuru Yuri, the first couple seasons, and Hamada Umaru-chan. The story follows an ex-Special Defense Forces soldier named Kamoi Tsubasa, who is hired as the family maid of a 10-year-old girl named Misha Takanashi, who lost her mother years earlier. And the series follows Misha's attempts to get rid of her while Tsubasa slowly becomes a hardcore lollicon. I know that you're not really looking forward to what I have to say about this, but hear me out, this is actually very interesting. Basically, it's Miss Kobayashi's Dragon Maid, except that's actually cosplay, and it's 10 times more uncomfortable than it already is. But the comedy surprisingly works in this show because I knew how fucked up the people's actions are, and the show knew how fucked up the people's actions are, but they don't go out of your way to throw it into your face and tell you this is what's happening, get over it. But instead, also have other characters, like Misha, question what's going on along with the audience. They also do a really good job of balancing out the weirdos and the normal people as Misha hangs out with a friend from school and has the occasional rival. 
that just is jealous of Misha, while Tsubasa is visited by another soldier turned maid named Midori, who I can only describe as darkness from Kanasuba, but that she's a masochist towards verbal insults. The show also has some touching moments as well, especially showing Misha and her late mother, showing that this show can be more than just a comedy that can either make you laugh or make you unsettled with what you're looking at. And because this was also made by Doga Kobo, the animation is also out there and colorful, and even though Tsubasa and Midori's outfits literally scream out, cosplay me, they do pop out with the color choice. And the opening and ending are both appealing with uh, the visuals and the music being one of the few normal things that this show has. But in the end, I saw Uza Made as a pretty funny show, and it's not the fact that this show had some weird shit in it, but it's how they present that weird shit to you, in addition to being on your side when you react to said weird shit. But with that said, if you're into dark comedy, you'd probably like it. But for me, it was surprising to say the least. I'm gonna give this also a 7 out of 10. Now we are on to our final two shows. The two shows on Saturday, we're gonna start with Goblin Slayer, aka Dungeons and Dragons the Anime. This is the latest anime from, East, from the studio White Fox, and it was directed by Takaharu Ozaki. This was the show that got everyone talking, and the one show from this anime season that's been talked about to death, so I won't be talking about the show as much as the other people who've been talking about it, so I'll just make it brief. The show follows a guy who's known as the Goblin Slayer in a world very similar to other isekai anime in terms of the conditions that it has people who accept quests in a fantasy world to earn money, and he is just known for slaying goblins, as he believes that goblins have no place in this world and that all of them would grow up to be raping and pillaging people. That's it. That, that, that's the story. I mean, that's, I, I don't know what else to tell you other than Jesus Christ, this was a roller coaster. Oh, it. God! I need a chug of that before I talk about this show. Apart from Crunchyroll getting a lot of backlash after the first episode that made him put a disclaimer before every episode afterwards, and the fact that White Fox skipped an entire arc from the light novel, and if you take out all the messed up shit that got people talking about Goblin Slayer as a show, it was just disappointing. Keep in mind, I'm, all, I'm taking out all the rape stuff, I'm taking, talk, taking out all of just the gore, I'm talking about story-wise, character-wise, it was disappointing. The characters aren't memorable other than Goblin Slayer, and there is no development between him and the other characters, as all he cares about is killing goblins, and it's getting to a point where he's going insane due to his sadistic urge to kill more goblins. All I, and all I can say about the animation and the soundtrack is that they're just okay. That's it. But if you ask me, this show overall is far from okay. When you have a show whose reputation was torn up to shreds by almost every popular anti-tuber on YouTube, and you don't have a stable story or characters to combat against it as a defense mechanism, what you have is maybe one of the worst shows this year that was a complete disaster, and I seriously hope that this doesn't have a season two. I mean, I know it's gonna have an OVA, but let's just hope it stops there. At least it's better than freaking non-human creature wife, whatever the fuck that was. Uh, but I'll give it a 4 out of 10. Uh, alright, and here is the final show, and the one show I'm actually very excited to talk about, and that was the latest anime series from Studio Trigger, known as SSSS Gridman. It was directed by Akira Amamaya, and is the latest anime from Studio Trigger, who teamed up with Subudaya Productions, the people who made the 1993 hit series Gridman the Hyper Agent and the Ultra series. The story follows Yuda, Rika, and Utsumi, who teams up with a being known as Gridman to fight against kaiju made by a classmate, classmate named Akane, and another being named Alexis. Or, for the first 11 episodes, that was the case. The final episode of this show was one of the most eventful and thought-provoking episodes I've seen in a while. Instead of having it be a conclusion that we all expected, at the end of the final episode, it's revealed that instead of it being about mechas fighting kaijus, with a reference to one of the shows that Grimman originated from, which I know everyone was completely excited about, it ended up being a show about rejecting escapist fantasies and owning up to your reality, despite how painful it may be. What do I mean by that? Well, let me explain. This is what I think happened. Uh, for people who don't know, uh, the series ends, and in the final scene, a woman wakes up from bed in the 3D world, and it's assumed to be Akane, or Akane's voice actor, that's who was playing her. Uh, so this is what I think happened. So the antagonist, Akane, 
got help from a being named Alexis to create her own world because she's very insecure socially in the real world, which leads to her being very popular at school since she made the world that way. But what Akane didn't know was that Alexis exploited her, vul her vulnerability to feed her negative emotions and ultimately absorb her, possibly using her to take down Gridman by making her create kaijus to take him down. In this case, Alexis and Gridman are both beings from some kind of higher plane or perhaps real world aliens or something while everyone else was just Akane's creations in her virtual world. In the series, it's said multiple times that Akane is a god. Akane is not a literal god, but is an actual human that was given the power by Alexis to create her own world. Everyone in the virtual world is modeled after someone Akane knows in real life. Now, questions aside, now Ed, I'm gonna stop talking about the final episode. I'm gonna tell you what I think about the show in general. One big strength that this show has is its tone. As it shifts gears from the main characters living a normal high school life to immediately fighting a kaiju, very similar to another show that no one would have guessed would have been referenced in this anime, Neon Genesis Evangelion. Hell, you can even say the final live action scene in the final episode is an Ava reference because End of Ava had the same thing. But the kaiju fights lead me to talk about the animation, which considering its studio trigger, which is starting to grow as one of my favorite anime studios, it's fluid, the character expressions are really good, and even the CGI is very well done during the fight scenes. And because the show is based off of a very popular show from 20 years ago, the story is structured very well where it has those nostalgic elements for older fans, but it also has elements for newcomers, and instead of having information being told to us, it's instead shown to us, especially through Akane, who has the best writing of any character in this show, as she's seen as, as the character who evokes as much fear as the kaijus themselves. Now, out of all the main characters, uh, Rika stands out to me, not because of the obvious reason, but she does stand out because she seemed to be the odd one out out of all the characters. While everyone else is cheering over the fact that they just beat another kaiju, Rika is wondering why she is even there and what's her role in all of this. And both Rika and Akane's development would intertwine as the series would go on, and it's engaging to say the least. Overall, I'm going to say 4S Gridman uh, it has the most passion out of any of these shows that I've reviewed in this video, and probably the most passion out of any show that I've reviewed on this channel, because of how much of a following that Gridman the Hyper Agent had, and it showed through a well-reinforced theme of friendship, great characters, and interesting mystery plots, and the best shot framing, cinematography direction of the year that Studio Trigger put a lot of effort into it. You could even say that about a fair amount of the uh, people at the studio are Gridman the Hyper Agent fans. It's just very fascinating to see something that people wanted to make come out to life. And with that, I'm giving that a 10 out of 10. Thank you guys for watching this very long video. Uh, if you like this video, hit the like button down below. If you want to see, uh, see me make a full video out of any of the shows I've reviewed, uh, you can let me know in the comments. If you like this video, again, you can like and subscribe. If you want to see more anime review videos in the future, you can also subscribe as well. If you want to see any videos that I made in the past, uh, coming very soon, there's going to be some videos on the screen as well as some in the description and the channel, but before that shows up on the screen, I want to say something. When I started this channel in May of 2018, I honestly didn't know what to expect. I, I didn't know if I was going to be really good or really thorough because I've had very little experience reviewing shows and movies in general, let alone anime. I never really paid attention to all the details. But now that I made this channel, it started to become fun. Like, I never really paid attention to reviewing anime until I saw like other review channels, Glass Reflection, Chris Stuckman, Anthony Fantano, and Nostalgia Critic. I watch all these guys and they make it look easy. And then it was after watching those guys that I started telling myself, hey, I can do this too. And it's hard to believe that I started this channel just by talking, looking down onto a phone. It's not even the phone I use now. It's, it's this phone. I, I don't use this phone anymore, but I started on this phone when I uploaded my first video, a Love Life School Idol project. Uh, I remember looking at uh, all the other videos that I uploaded as well. The one that the first one that really blew up was when I reviewed Monica Magica, 
and for God knows why, uh, the most viewed video on my channel is an etchy. <laughs> As uh, Kiss Sis, a show that I've intentionally refused to promote even though it has 223 views, and I don't know why, <laughs> but I'm very grateful for that. Uh, it's just, 2018 has just been a very wild ride for me, not only you know, with the videos I'm making, but also outside of YouTube as well. And all I can say is that I'm looking forward to making more videos in 2019. I'm looking forward to collab with people in review videos. I'm looking forward to making more videos in general, uh, because I can already tell that some of you guys are excited to watch these videos. Um, so really all I can say is to the 25 subscribers that I've had since May, thank you for subscribing to my channel. For the 2,500 views with the 2,500 people that watch my videos. Thank you. To the people who have liked my videos, thank you. And to the people who dislike my videos, thank you, because I see that as constructive criticism to get ready and to get better in my videos. <laughs> and so with that, at the end of tw uh, 2018, I want to do something different. Uh, instead of just picking a random show to review, I'm going to let you guys pick what the next show is going to be. I'm going to list off all the shows and movies that I'm ready to review, and I want to hear you. I want to hear you guys in the comments. What show or movie should I review? If you want me to review another Ghibli film, I'll review another Ghibli film. If you want me to review like a movie, I'll review a movie. If you want me to review a show, I'll review a show. You know, that's that's just something I want to try out, and hopefully, I get to keep on doing it as uh, 2019 continues, so... <sighs> I'm sorry, this year's just been amazing. Um, I can't tell you how grateful I am to make these videos, and the amount of passion I've put into it. It's just, it's just fun. This whole thing's fun. That's all I can say. So I think with that out of the way, uh, my name is Payne, and I'll see you in 2019.